Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christy fernandez Call. Um, she's been a friend of Beaverworks for many years um, and has a, a really outstanding record of working in different companies from Google to Lyft to Apple as well. Um, and like I said, I usually run into her at Sandbox events. Sandbox is a entrepreneurial program here at MIT where students submit ideas um, to get funded by MIT for them to work on their ideas. And the ideas that come out of those, those student projects is just amazing. So it's fun to run around, chat with Christy, see what the projects are. And hopefully you guys will have some good questions too uh, for Christy for her presentation. All right, awesome. thank you. Thank you, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, okay. So I know you all just had lunch and now the carbs are setting in. I would love for this to be interactive, but I'm also happy to kind of help tell you a little bit about my journey, what I did from when I started as an athlete. We'll talk about sports. We'll talk about disciplined entrepreneurship, work ethics, what that all means and how that actually translated from when I was a high school student. I would say actually from when I was five years old. And I know that sounds pretty funny, but you'll understand why in, in a little bit. So it's a joy to be back here. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Bob. It's as if I'm coming back to see family, which is always a joy, as you all know. You always want to feel welcomed. Um, I come back to Cambridge pretty frequently, um, and I say this really, really transparently. If at any point anything resonates during this talk, and whether you'd like to raise your hand and ask the question, or maybe there's an epiphany that happens shortly thereafter, my door is always wide open. Feel free to link with me on LinkedIn today, tomorrow, and at any point in the future. Okay, so we'll get, we'll get the show going. Um, there's a motto in my family. I can't claim that we coined the phrase because we did not, but it's a motto. I'm a huge family person. There's a lot of values that I learned as a little girl, and I continue to learn as I age. And that is, if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? And I'll let those words sink in because at the time that I heard those words, and a lot of my family members share idioms and they share statements and sayings. And as a child, I kind of ignored it. As I aged, I started thinking more and more about it, which is there's no time like the present. Think about your strengths, think about your challenges, think about your work ethics. What makes you, you? And think, you know, look ahead and reason back and think about what is the footprint you wanna leave in the world? Why, how, and when? And it doesn't have to be as deep as that. It could literally be, I'm preparing for the next advanced placement exam, which let's face it, it's daunting. At least it was daunting for me when I was in high school. And so when we think about the triangle for me in my life, there are three different things that you see here. And we'll start out with curiosity because I, I another confession, I'm a dreamer for better. I wouldn't say for worse, it just is. And my head is more often than not in the clouds and I'm thinking about challenges that I've had, challenges that I see other people have, and how I can leverage technology for me, um, well, through my lens, how I can leverage technology to maybe take a stab at some of these challenges. So we'll focus on curiosity. You'll see also I talk about sports because I was a student athlete in elementary and beyond. And at, at the apex of that triangle, I was always intrigued by this book called The Magicians of Langley, which is about spy tech, not because I wanted to be a spy, but because I thought defense and technology is the epitome of being able to have access to labs, to innovation, to expertise. And again, outside of if not you, then who, if not now, then when, I grew up in, in a family that laid a foundation that said, knowledge is power, not to have power over people, but to have power with people. So you'll see a lot of what I talk about is really anchored on helping others, helping others understand the challenges that you have, how you wanna to contribute to those challenges by solving real world problems. And what does that mean? Do we know what that means at the age of five? Maybe, maybe not. That's for you all to kind of decide. At the right-hand side, you'll see venture capital and entrepreneurship. And that's really where I am in my journey at this point in time. So we'll see a little bit of that later. So I told you the story kind of starts at the age of five. Um, well, I had a challenge that needed a solution. 
Now, while my picture on my right-hand side, your left-hand side is me barely one years old, when I was five, I couldn't reach the top of the counter. And I had hardworking parents that worked in real estate in New York City that would commute several hours each day to come back home to me. And on the weekends, like many parents, what do they like to do? Not wake up at 6 a.m. What do kids like to do? Wake up at 6 a.m. So very quickly, I realized that I couldn't tell my parents I wanted to wake up to go get a bowl of cereal. Otherwise, they'd say go back to bed. So I would kind of scale the stairway. <laughs> and I recognized I couldn't pour my own bowl of, with milk and reach the counter. Now, this is before they actually built these nice stools. And the reality is, is that you still need a parent or guardian, right, to actually watch you. So does anyone know what that machine is on the left? Anyone? Yes, a Rude Rube Goldberg machine, right? So at the age of five, obviously I wasn't thinking Rube Goldberg. I don't think I even knew the term, but hindsight's 2020, right? Um, when I was in elementary school, I think it was at the age of 10, um, not to, you know, very close to my son's age, when I thought, you know, we were being introduced to lasers and I thought, hey, we'll do a Rube Goldberg type of style machine where we'll activate some switches. I, I knew the words, but I didn't know actually how to do that. Well, I had amazing parents that went to a hobby shop in New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey. I claim New York as well because I traveled back and forth. And they said, let's, we don't know. They weren't engineers. Um, they said, we don't know the solution, but we are going to help you understand and see and assess and simplify. So the one on my left-hand side wasn't the actual machine, but didn't, it didn't look that far from it. And so we take a step back and being curious and seeing and understanding your own challenges, right? In my mind, I need to not only solve it for me that I'm now 11, but I need to solve it for all five-year-olds because clearly everyone should have access to cereal in the morning. So that may be a little bit, you know, in jest, but the reality is I started to think about being an engineer, not even having access to what engineering means at the age of five and 11. So a lot of the things that we do, every step along our lives, the people we speak to, the mentors that help us and lift us up, really drive, they almost like place little breadcrumbs um, and really pave the way for what we do in the present and future. Okay, so we'll talk about sports. Now, also in elementary school, I learned, I was an AAU athlete, I played basketball, I was a shooting guard, that opened windows of opportunity. I'm a first generation, four year PhD. Clearly I like going to school because I keep going back for more and more education. I'm a lifelong learner. But at this point in time, basketball opened up a window of opportunity and that was to get um, a scholarship to a boarding school um, outside of Princeton called the Lawrenceville School. I also, I remember I mentioned New York City because my parents worked in New York City. We had a, an apartment there. I was able to play for one of the best AAU um, basketball teams in New York out of the South Bronx called Gauchos. So they have born NBA, WNBA players. Clearly I am not a WNBA player. Kudos to all that, that make it as such. And um, that was an inflection of everything's going great, right? I have this scholarship. I have this opportunity to go to a boarding school. And the tenants at Gauchos was to play hard, work hard, and to give back. Notice how the first one is about you, play hard. Second one is work hard. The third one is to give back, to think about how you pay it forward. So at the time that I was an athlete, I was also thinking about, well, I wasn't actually thinking about the work ethic, but instilling a discipline, the work ethic and ethics about it, how you're a team player, all of these really contribute to how you are an entrepreneur, how you are a dreamer, and what you do in the present and in the future. You'll also, also notice another acronym, BEEF. A lot of folks that play basketball, some may know it, some may not, but it really contributes to physics. So, and, and now I'm talking about it from the lens of a phys, I'm a physicist turned engineer, um, and it's balance, eyes on target, elbow in and follow through. You follow these metrics and you compare that to projectile motion. The follow through is literally a projectile in motion, right? And your accuracy and precision improves by following that acronym. That might sound silly, but it actually does work. Okay, 
So um, things are going really, really well. I'm an all-star athlete going to a boarding school. Uh, academically, scholastically, I was on doing well, getting good grades. What happens? Um, and these inflection points are important because remember the challenge of the cereal, not being able to get cereal, I wanna build a cereal dispenser. I had another challenge, which was a subject that I loved, right, physics, I wasn't doing so well. Not only that, I had to sit out for the season, my junior year, and this is when it's like peak recruiting for division one, division two scholarships, right? Um, and um, I had a terrible ankle injury. I had a great orthopedic surgeon that helped bring me back to um, full health. But that being said, the fear and the stress and the struggle of, and the confidence, will I be able to perform the same way? I used that stress and strain of not doing well in physics. Guess what I did? I went, internalized it. It was challenging, but I said, how do I make lemonade out of these two lemons, right? Um, and that kind of brings me to my next part, the vector, the last two parts of the triangle here, which is technology and then entrepreneurship and venture capital. And here's why. Um, I know it's probably small on, on the screen here as you look at it, um, but I told you I was first gen. Um, I've had amazing mentors. Um, even Bob Shen, who's sitting here, inspired me to teach compressive holography, computational imaging to undergraduates and graduate students. My first job out of um, graduate school was working at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. And the ability to just remember that tenant from Gauchos, right? Work hard, play hard, give back, right? Teaching is an amazing opportunity to give back, to learn how to explain different topics in different ways. And it's a win-win for everyone involved, right? So thank you, Bob, um, for inspiring that. I appreciate that. You'll see other names of individuals. I'm in conversation with all the mentors that have ever given a helping hand. Even those that have not, I still stay in contact. So remember who you interact with. You never know 30 years later where you'll find yourselves paying it forward to one another or to others. So be thankful, right? I'm super thankful for all the people that believed in me from my undergrad to my PhD. This all took people, you know, leveraging their tender love and kindness to lift me up. So I'm riding on the shoulders of others that came before me. Um, great quote at the bottom by Maya Angelou, right? If you get, give, if you learn, teach. So my foundation started out with my parents. I have amazing parents who believed in me, who lifted me up and told me, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? And that has resonated throughout my, my career to this day. So find the person that believes in you, that lifts you up, that opens doors, understands you, but also is willing to tell you, you know, when you're incorrect, right? Not tell you what your path is, but give you some shining light so that you can decide. Okay, so to be an entrepreneur, I focused on, and at the time I wasn't saying, I want to be an entrepreneur, therefore let me focus on getting degrees. No, again, my family said knowledge is power, to have power with people to do more for others and not only be thinking of what you could do it for yourself. And so um, I focused on uh, knowledge. All of the other attributes also hold. I had start to see and assess what risk tolerance is, but you'll see I'll be able to do that on the technology side as we think about research and development and then scaling product at scale at Apple. Also, keep me honest on time. If I say anything that you have a question about, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, I'm happy to, to stop and, and address your questions. Okay, so when we talk about technology, I had an affinity, like you all know by now, for problem solving. Um, in graduate school, that really focused on what we'll call the electromagnetic spectrum. And while it's pretty wide, I focused on the design of combining, the design of making cameras. So think of your cell phone. Everyone has a cell phone, right? There are several cameras, and there's actually a lighter on the back that was just added. It's also on the iPad. Apple isn't the only vendor that started to do this. Actually, Google was the first to kind of pioneer this time of flight. And that's the ability to detect distance right, with a flash of light. So I worked on long web IR cameras. So that is 
Everyone now, if we took a long wave IR image of you, your heat signature would emanate and that would create a high resolution, moderate resolution image. Um, so from spectrometers to images to concealed weapons detection, I happened to work on all three. I had an amazing advisor that didn't believe in, you know, write one paper on a single topic and then write five papers on the same topic. He said in order to, well, he didn't say in order to graduate, but effectively what I saw it as a grad student was, you know, five different topics and, you know, we'll figure out what the theme is. Um, and it was computational imaging. So the marriage of algorithms, now it would be generative AI as, as applied to embedded compute that's solving, you know, a lot of different problems uh, for a particular goal. So across the electromagnetic spectrum, bless you. Um, and by this time it's Apple and then um, Lyft and then what I did in graduate school. So a lot of these different terms here, I'll just distill them. So compressive sensing we just talked about, I worked on weather satellites actually at Lincoln Lab led by um, Bill Blackwell in Division 9. So Division 9 is the aerospace division still, yes. Um, and then intelligent sensing. So how do we record? So everyone knows the RGB camera, the red, green, and blue um, uh, filters are mapped to the cones, cones for color, right? Rods for contrast, so cones in your eyes. So that's a computational intelligence sensor. Why? It's taking filter functions at the image sensor and it's translating everything it sees in the world with some optics to something that you all can see and take a nice image, right? Which is why Apple right, iterates each year to make it better. Wide field of view, in focus, considering jitter and so forth. So that's intelligence sensing, pushing to the compute what you don't wanna actually embed in the optics because it's pricey. And we're all about cost, size, weight, and power reduction when it comes to products in defense and even in consumer. Okay, so worked on some periscope systems. They're called digital mass, again, also at, at Lincoln. And then we talked about Apple depth sensing. So I worked on the team that brought Face ID to the world. I was actually started out as a special projects uh, group member. We worked publicly, I can say autonomous systems, everything in that um, topic, I'll just put on the shelf for right now. But what I can talk about is, like I mentioned, um, Face ID structured light uh, and LIDAR. So why LIDAR room scanning? basically at your fingertips. Think bringing the technology, right, that was in a large scale that scanned the surface of the moon in your fingertips. Obviously very different scale, very different object size and resolution, but you can think of it as, as such. We'll focus on autonomous systems and uh, digital health uh, and maybe hit on some Gen AI insights. Okay, so, um, you know, in a broad stroke, what I had worked on in defense, and then as I moved to Apple, it was consumer electronics. Defense, high risk, high reward, consumer, right? Low risk, big payoff. Why? Because there are over a million phones shipped each year. Apple has a huge market cap, but they aren't the only ones. Um, so when you think about what you're learning, why you're learning, how you're learning it, right? Really you can, for me, I distilled it into you know, a Venn diagram. And when I was thinking about why transportation, well, actually the systems design that I had learned at Lincoln and what I had learned in my PhD in terms of intelligent sensing lent itself to how do we design autonomous vehicles? Really they're machine eyes, right? Superhuman vision located on a vehicle to keep everyone safe. So that's what I did. Um, after Apple, I went to work at Lyft. This is a perfect example of a mentor friend, colleague from Apple saying, hey, there's a great opportunity. Why don't you come and go lead a team at Lyft? Um, so I went ahead and did that. I trusted the individual um, and, um, and we had a great, a great time. So at Lyft, really their focus is how do you improve the lives of people um, with the world's best transportation, right? So they wanna give access to everyone everywhere. And um, this is one of the vehicles that I worked on. So this is, um, a branch called Level 5. They were acquired by Toyota, a subsidiary of Toyota called Woven Planet. And so I did that for a little bit. We'll take a pause and think about like, what is an autonomous system? There's a lot that we can talk about here, but if we just keep it simple and we say, what are three things that are the most important? Um, it's, you need to sense, right? Remember I build sensors of different sizes and kinds across the electromagnetic spectrum. It needs to think, why? Because it needs to understand, right? And perceive, right? We call that perception. Um, and then it needs to, to act, 
And so you can think about it from a system block diagram here. How do you achieve that? Well, you need controls to help action that's state-based or it's machine learn based, right? Um, and you need compute, right? Where does the brain come from? How do we drive? Well, we have a brain that helps us do a variety of things, one of which is semantic segmentation, big word. Um, but effectively, you know, what I'm doing right now is change detection. Everyone that's moving, I can see the move. Our eyes are really good at that, right? And then, you know, am I seeing every person, right? And being able to, to detect some background. No, I can see people, right? So in my mind, I'm already creating boxes. I don't see that through my eyes, but effectively that needed to be translated into the compute through algorithms. Okay, so just alluded to that semantic segmentation. This is what superhuman eyes do when they're trying to achieve what our mind does so cleverly well in real time, right? So you can see the different attributes, boxes around cars. Those are all also assisted through annotation, which means there are humans in the loop, right? Detecting pixels and saying, this is a car, this is you know an animal, this is a person. And that's a prior that's fed into a lot of different algorithms to help make an autonomous vehicle actually be successful at what it does, which is superhuman perception, right? Cool. So. Um, we talked about sense, think, and act. The overarching core of what we're really talking about when we think about requirements for each of the sensors requirements for the vehicles is called systems design. I learned the foundation of systems design at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. And while this isn't an advertisement for, for Lincoln, by, by any means, I'm just transparently sharing with you, that core foundation really helped me as I went to Apple as I went to Lyft, as I went to Waymo. And truth be told, it helps me as I focus on digital health uh, and Gen AI. Why? Because you need to understand what you're designing, who you're designing it for, and when the time is right to actually create a roadmap to act on the requirements and design and work with contract manufacturers to be able to ship a product. Okay, so what am I showing you here? Sort of this design process is a flywheel, right? You have to start out with some research and, and development. You need a prototype and then the rest goes on. Then you need a, a final product. In um, consumer electronics, we call this uh, pre-proto EVT, DVT, PVT. Lots of acronyms, by the way, as you transition from, actually, I would, it, it resonates across defense or translates across defense through, through um, commercial. Um, and so you'll see, we talked about sense, think and act. Um, when you think about it as a system in terms of an autonomous vehicle, you can think of it from the standpoint of a symphony, right? Sounds funny, but if you would allow me to kind of distill, which is in a symphony, instruments are placed strategically, right? So that cacophony doesn't ensue. It's pleasant to the ear. Um, and I'm thinking of, you know, John Williams, just to anchor, because I know that there are, there's a spectrum of also um, orchestral types, right? And so when you think about the sensors, there's a constellation, right? So trombones, trumpets, et cetera. The constellation of sensors is camera, LIDAR, radar, ultrasonics, et cetera. But then it's the orchestration of the sensors, right? The orchestration of all the instruments in an orchestra. So this is how it translates. The orchestration is really how have you calibrated each of the sensors individually and with respect to other sensors so that you get a holistic view of what is in front of the vehicle so that you get that superhuman ability to see, perceive, and act, sense, think, and act. But there's practical challenges, and the challenges are the following. There are a lot of folks that like to tamper with sensors. Uh, there's also environmental conditions that make the sensors pretty dirty. Yes, you can create cleaning mechanisms. That's not seamless. That's also another moving part that you need to account for in terms of repeatability and reliability. So here's just some practical uh, challenges in terms of contrast, in terms of obscuration and lighter clouds um, pick up a lot of different signatures. And the AIML autonomy landscape is, is complex, right? So think about what you might wanna work on in particular, whether it's the system itself or whether it's a particular attribute related to uh, perception, sensing, again, the think, act landscape. Okay, so um, this is actually a quote that's on the wall of an auditorium like, like this one. Before you go into the auditorium that Steve Jobs spoke, 
Um, this is a quote that you get to, you have the opportunity to see every time you walk in and out. And so this is one of which I grew to love, um, but did not really understand it initially. Um, the first one I'll tell you versus this one was um, uh, really emphasized at Apple, which was understand what you say yes to, but really important is understand what you say no to. And it's not because you're saying no, because it's easy, but you're saying no, because it's really hard. A silly example would be, um, <laughs> I want to go to see the, the next Barbie movie, but I also want to go, you know, the, the current Barbie movie, but I also want to go running. Well, maybe for some, that would be easy to say no to. Let's just say for me, for this case in point, I want to do both. Well, I have to choose. I can't be two places at one time. I'm just one person, right? So this translates to personal life. This translates to um, business life and all the different areas in between. So now focusing on this quote, right? Essentially, if you do something well, well, do it well and 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 move on and, and try to make another footprint and, and see and be the change that you want to see in the world, right? So that's what I did. Um, how am I doing on time? Good? Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so that's what I did. So we talked about me as sort of a uh, a mom, a daughter, a child, right? Inspired at the age of five. Um, and also, you know, a technologist um, really trying to make a dent in the world to bring autonomous transportation, uh, make it a reality. Also dabbled in um, bringing the LiDAR, right? To the iPhone and iPad and how we story tell a really complicated technology into the hands of, of everyone everywhere, right? Why, why even have a LiDAR? Um, Remember I told you I got injured um, and um, while being all these attributes and everything in between, the inflection of getting injured, um, having an amazing um, son, understanding my physiology um, and, and my body and chatting with other girls and people, there's tons of data being sent to us every day on our Apple phone. Um, having been at those places, right, saw them falling short in terms of design. So my next chapter is how do I create more transparency, more access to health data and actionable insights? Um, so what we're doing at DaVinci Wearables, so I'm an entrepreneur, left corporate world, um, there's an opportunity cost there, to go back to the drawing board, to be that, to continue to be that lifelong learner and understand you know, pain points that are a reality today. So I'm making a underwearable health and wellness platform. And what we're doing is we're providing personalized health and wellness insights. Um, and we're doing it for women to start off with. And uh, why? Well, the reality is a lot of girls and women are flying blind. Um, there's a lot of triage after you have a complication, you go to your healthcare provider um, and they say, okay, this is what you need to do. But I want to start at the root, which is uh, many girls will go through puberty eventually through menopause. Um, and there's a lot that needs to be learned in terms of hormonal health. The first attribute you see here is 75% of elite female athletes where those margins matter. Think Olympic, think WNBA. Remember, I'm looking at it through the lens of the student athlete. And while I was in the WNBA, the, the truth is still holds, which is it's sort of very confusing. Um, what your body is doing, when it's doing it, and why it's doing it. The second here is one in 10 females um, have been diagnosed uh, with a medical condition that contributes to a variety of symptoms that they have on a monthly basis. And the third is a lot of athletes go through what's called triad, uh, triad and red s which is their nutrition, the way they work their body um, is not good for them. Um, Nike just came out with an article that about 50% of girls drop from playing athletic sports after puberty. And so why? Clinical studies fall short of having women actually part of their studies, which is why more must be done, more awareness and, and more understanding. So my goal is to not have females fly blind. Um, there's a correlation here also to just what's available. You know, I don't think anyone sitting here would wanna wear all of that at any given time. Many people are wearing Aura, Apple Watches, whoops, Garmin, but what is it actually telling you? The information that you get on your HRV, what do you do about it? Just recently, LeBron James's son, right, in a practice, got injured, and uh, actually he didn't get injured, he went into cardiac arrest. So what data, 
would would he have wanted to have to to not prevent it, but at least know that it was coming? Because I mean, no one really should be getting hurt in a practice, right? Or have a terrible thing happening to them. There's a terrible thing that happens to him. So, no single tool or wearable today addresses female physiology precisely. It's nothing's not invasive. Nothing is real time, and nothing is seamless. So what we're doing is we have a proprietary liner solution. Our goal is to be the Gore-Tex for health, in particular for women's health, for active women, teenage through menopause. Why? Because we want women to understand their physiology and have that balance with what they desire their peak performance to be, right? So no more flying blind. You're literally lined with Da Vinci. We're starting out with underwear. Why? Well, I think if we did a poll, a majority of people here are wearing underwear and legally, you can't leave the house without pants on. So we're working with consumer behavior, right? Instead of having it be an add-on like an Apple Watch. It's okay, you can laugh, an Apple Watch, et cetera. And what you see on the left, actually, yeah, your left-hand side is what's available today. A lot of athletes are wearing catapult as an example, different metrics, right? We're focused on temperature, why it's a vital sign. There's a heat strain index as you work out. And it's also correlated where we're, where you are as a female, if you identify physiologically as so in your, in your cycle. And then we're doing secretion analysis. So we're able to look at hormonal health. Think COVID tests, but not it's measuring hormones. And it's in your underwear instead of uh, being a nasal swab. Okay, so here's what we do. We plan, we measure, we infer. Why? Again, because we don't want to just tell you this is your HRV, this is your temperature, and this is your hormonal health. We want to tell you you should prioritize when you work out, how you work out, and why you're working out. So strength training or more recovery over um, go run five miles because that's what you need to do to be that active female or elite athlete. So the user experience, you enroll, you have daily updates. Um, and then we create a sense of community. There's a whole um, confidence in terms of what's inside of your headspace to understand your body. We want to really reduce the stress. That, that causes. So social health and wellness is really important to us. So I bring you back to the quote, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? My journey has spanned being a little girl wanting to have cereal poured because I didn't want to disturb my parents or be told to go back to bed. <laughs> and that really was my journey into not knowing what it meant to be an engineer but at least creating a pathway to understand how to become an engineer. And I had mentors explaining to me, you want to do physics and then engineering. So I've been anchored by people lifting me up, giving me that opportunity to learn more and be really diligent and disciplined, applying the work ethic as well as the ethics of helping others and problem solving through the lens of not just my lens, but through the lens of others, identifying what is falling short in the commercial sector and really go out, going out, right? Um, for me, it's not in my nature to want to just stay, right? Like Steve Jobs says, or had said, right? Do one thing well, move on, do the next thing, right? Um, so I leave you with, Think about the strengths and the challenges, your work ethic, who you are, how that persists, and when you look ahead and reason back, and how you want to leave a footprint in the world. Thank you so much. Any questions? I have a couple of questions, so that's okay. Um, my first one was, how do you address privacy concerns regarding like wearable technology in, you know, through innovation, things like that? Yeah, great question. So I didn't get into it here, but we're creating a bio time capsule. So at the very outset, so let's say um, um, chat GPT, you ask questions today, your data is not, what's your name you said? Luke, right? Luke, you said? Yeah. Luke Min? Yeah. Luke Min, sorry. Okay, so Luke Min, if you ask a question to chat GPT, it knows that you're Luke Min. We're partnered with a company, great company uh, called Private AI that would have redacted the fact that you, Luke Min, asked a question. Now, if you add any P what we call PII, personally identifiable information in your inquiry, that would get redacted. So the data that we store, privacy first, right? Because if, if I asked anyone in the room, you go to the doctor once a year on average, 
typically in high school. That changes as, as you evolve. Don't recommend that. I think you should regularly go to the doctor. Um, sorry, public service announcement here. Do the right thing. Um, uh, but generally, if, if someone, if you asked anyone, said, do you know where your data lives or where it has traveled? No one could say yes in our healthcare system, right? We want to flip that switch with DaVinci, which is any data that's stored in our platform, you have a private hash. The minute you want to relinquish or give access to us, you can. We're not in the business of selling individual data. We really want to make an impact. Women's health, like we need an understanding and there isn't an understanding with specificity today. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this is my second and last question. Go for it. Um, you, you mentioned that ethics um, part, play a part in your career and your um, life choices. Has there ever been a point in your career or in your life that you had to turn down an opportunity because it violated like your, like, I guess your moral code? Yeah, I mean, um, so I won't go into the specifics because this is also being as uh, publicized um, and that's just to be principled, right? So on the wall of Sloan, uh, I'm not going to do the quotes justice, but it's, you know, creating a principled leader. So, and I believe wholeheartedly in that. Um, I've walked away from jobs when leading um, groups of individuals um, if I thought there wasn't principled leadership from, um, yeah, if I, if I didn't think the people that I was looking up to, literally, right, um, were not being principled. So short answer is yes. The importance or what's equally important is that you understand your moral compass. I had a great foundation from my parents, right? It was, you know, and I also had some challenges, right? As a, as a child, you learn, right? That you shouldn't lie. Do you lie? Do you, you know, then we say, well, I fibbed, right? A lie is a lie is a lie, right? We try to create these gray areas. So understand what your moral compass is, understand what you will walk away from and what you will stay, because that gets murky. We're all influenced, right? There's peer pressure, right? Who, who believes in peer pressure? There is peer pressure everywhere, right? So, you know, there's peer pressure when you go to a party. There's peer pressure in everything that you do. You play the game. Do you go out instead of studying? I'm not saying one way is right or wrong. It's just as a fact, right? So you have to figure out what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it. My grandfather, um, he's Spaniard and from Puerto Rico and he had these sayings and uh, one of his sayings was I'll tell you it, and I'm translating I might butcher but I'll tell you who you are if you tell me who you walk with and I didn't understand it then he's now passed right I understand it and hold it with so much love and and, and heartfelt you know want right for more of those wisdoms but it, it's really important for you know that's going to happen what happened to you in high school persists throughout your life from a peer pressure standpoint, it's just people do it in different ways. That was super long-winded, but hopefully that, that answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, go ahead. Oh, uh, what did you study in your undergrad? Uh, physics. Yeah, so uh, actually, physics and international economics, but I graduated early without the international economics. Yeah. Oh, um, why did you name your company Da Vinci? Yeah. Okay. So um, Da Vinci, great question. So Da Vinci is a mixture of art, technology, and engineer. He's actually the father of wearables if, um, from a historical standpoint. Um, also, he created the Vitruvian individual. So if you look at that from an artist standpoint. Now, that being said, during a time that um, the Renaissance females were um, not embodied for their beauty, he focused on their beauty. Um, versus the alternative, which was being more sexualized. And so the themes just from art meets design meets function, like form, fit, and function. It just, I love art. If you, if you can't get that, <laughs> I, I, you know, from what I'm saying, I, I love art and I love engineering. And I think um, a lot of times folks say engineers are not artists and I just don't believe that, right? And so he was the perfect marriage of all three. Um, I have another question. Yeah. You still hoop now? Oh, I do. So, so I have to wear a brace. Yeah. And actually I, I, yeah, I do, but not as, not as like strong as I used to. <laughs> I think Christy has better sneakers than Bob today. So <laughs> what were your first steps to starting your company? Yeah. Um, so for me personally, this is through my little lens. Um, I had to be okay with 
the risk associated with leaving a corporate role. They talk about um, the golden handcuffs in Silicon Valley. And really what they mean, it's the metaphor for um, there's a high liquidity in Silicon Valley when they recruit you. We'll just put it that way. Um, and you get bonuses every ever so often, right? Which almost keeps you wanting to stay within the company. Um, and so, and there's a comfort in just knowing you have access to a 401k, like all these different things that it's, it's hard to be an adult, right? <laughs> you have to think about retirement, even if it's not your time to retire. Um, you have to think about like all these different benefits that you don't necessarily have starting out as a startup. So truth be told, I increased my risk tolerance by saying while I'm working, um, I'm going to go back to MIT, go get an MBA because I've always wanted to start my company and I need to sharpen that pencil. And why? Because, and maybe this is too transparent. I had a PhD. I have a PhD. Um, there's some, everyone knows about stereotypes, peer pressure, right? We can, we can ignore that they don't exist or we can say they do exist. I'm not saying they're right. Um, um, but it, coming into Silicon Valley with a PhD um, had some sort of, well, you know, you can go to the whiteboard and you can derive. And then if you come from certain schools, they're like, oh, you're professorial. And while I came in, I was telling Bob uh, before this, you know, I thought that was a compliment, you know, like, yeah, professorial. So the reality is, is that being able to understand the language and semantics associated with business, building a product, you need to... You need to be able to understand the lingo in order to be able to contribute. That is true for any sort of topic, right? And so I knew that I had to go back to school or I felt I could spend time reading it on my own, which that's feasible. A lot of people do that as well. I just knew that I'm so focused on building products that making the time with all of those audiobooks, I wouldn't be able to do that myself. So again, know your strengths and weaknesses. That was my weakness. I went and decided to... Um, educate myself. And um, that improved my risk tolerance for saying, yes, Christy, you can, right? There's this energy in universities where like anything is possible. Um, I think that gets further culled when you're sort of in a very structured, um, I wouldn't say just corporate. It's just when you have more structure than like the windows that you see out just seem to be like foggy and obscured. Whereas in an academic setting, like the life, like I don't know. There's so much energy. Does that make sense? So I needed to increase my risk tolerance and then say, it's okay if I take a jump off of, you know, I take a leap and um, may not have the security blanket of a corporate role. Yeah. Um, my question was, how do you balance starting a company that helps something for the common good versus a company that makes money? Oh, wow. That is a great question. Um, well, so <sighs> I am a firm believer money will come. Like, a, again, I took a leap of leaving a corporate role, huge opportunity cost in doing that financially, but I just like left things. So making Da Vinci has never been about the money. My my co-founder, Bella and Friel, and my colleague, um, Edward Bentecourt, when we came together, like a lot of what we're helping to bring to the world, we're doing it on spare time. For me, I'm now full-time. For them and even our advisors, like... You know, if the conversation has always been, tell me how much equity that you'll give me in the company, and then I'll tell you what I, how I can help you. That's just not part of our values, right? So, I mean, at some point you have to balance, be, be, be really sharpened in the, in the pencil and perspective of the company needs to stay afloat, right? So we're not a big company right now. We're balancing it by doing accelerators. MIT invested in us. We were part of Delta V, which is MIT's educational accelerator. So there have been instances and inflections where a lot of people have believed in us, where they're not, they're giving us, it's, we've been blessed, we've been getting money, um, sponsorship and, and so forth. Yeah, but you're, it's a great question. I mean, we have to think about it all the time, but it's not the first thing on our checklist. Yeah. Do you have any ideas for the future of DaVinci wearables? Yeah, so many. I don't know if we have time to tell them all, um, but um, let's see the future of DaVinci. I mean, literally my, I believe in a world where, you know, every piece of clothing is, is lined with DaVinci, not because it's DaVinci. It could even just be like lined and no one knows that it's DaVinci. Um, 
But right now, like how many of you all might need water, need hydration? How many of you all, you know, might need to understand hormonal levels, right? And be given an indication on your phone that, hey, you should see your healthcare provider or it's time to go walk for a mile. Why? Because it's the healthy thing to do. Why? Because this is the goal that you set. So like, I just believe in a world where we're lining ourselves with intelligence, right? Because it's one less thing that we have to think about. The world is so complicated and we have to think about so many things like getting into college. What is our job after college? What's, what are we going to major in? That thinking about like, are you healthy or not? Which is stressful. And I think a lot of people only think about it when they're not healthy, right? When there's actually a problem. I just want us to be in prevention, risk assessment mode versus we're already unhealthy and now we really have to do something about it. So, and I, and I believe that to be accessible to all. I think we have technology that way that does this, but you have to go to these high performance technology for spas in Spain and Italy, and you have to have a lot of money to get access to that sort of full body MRI. Um, and not everyone has money to do that. And so I wanna be able to have everyone have access. Right. Uh, we have a couple questions from students online. Huh? Hi, I'm right here. Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, there are, uh, so Samita asked that, uh, she said that there are some concerns about radiation close to body parts affecting hormones and health, particularly with wearable technology. Uh, she was asking about the sensors in the underwear product that you displayed earlier and whether or not there might be like a concern with that or like in the future, is that something you're going to research? Yeah, great question. So um, if I look this way, will I? Yeah, yeah. so okay. that bubble okay. right there. Just so that, no, thank you so much for asking the question. Um, our first product is literally a thermometer on the waistline of your underwear. Comes out uh, at the Consumer Electronics Showcase. So no radiation there. It's a heat transfer device. Um, really similar if anyone has bought like power meters from Thor Labs, really similar to how that tells you um, you know, watts per meter squared. So, so, um, that's our initial, um, uh, product to, to society. Why? Because not everyone knows about Da Vinci, right? So how do you trust a brand? Um, how do you build that trust? Right. So we do that by keeping things super, super simple, uh, and not having it be the panty liner, right. Or li liner, uh, as an example, um, no radiation in the liner liner, it's a secretion analysis. So similar to your COVID test that was a nasal swab that was tuned into a particular biomarker, right? We're tuning, you can think of this like strip to a particular biomarker that we can detect in secretion. Um, so and now to the third part, are there regulatory concerns? Um, class one and class two regulation already on feminine hygiene products, there's a, a precedent and it's a function of whether if something is invasive, right, going internal or non-invasive, our product is non-invasive. Um, so as we go from everyday health and wellness, which is a score, to everyday health care, pun intended, um, uh, then we have to think about, are we doing prognostic, right, uh, or more of a clinical? We're not there yet. Um, that's what we foresee to be in the future. We have a regulatory expert on our, our advisory board. Um, but that's in, into the future. Did I answer all the questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, Nathan Shu also had another question. Uh, what were some of the biggest challenges of creating a startup? Oh, wow. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges, it's super lonely, right? You do have a team, uh, you do have advisors, but morning, noon, and night, you, at least for me, I can't stop thinking about what challenges I want to overcome and what is the minimum viable path, the MVP, to do that with the least amount of time, right? Because I believe the change is now. And it's, you know, similar to everything you heard me talk about, the challenges, one can call it challenge, another one can call it failure. Like when I got injured, I felt like I had failed. When I had ch challenges with physics, I felt like I was not just failing, right? The confidence that my parents have in me, but also myself, right? I'm, I need to be that best student athlete, right? And, and I think there's a lot of pressure, right? I left my corporate job. Wow. What, you know, am I, should I have stayed, right? I think these are all really natural questions and me being overly honest and transparent. It's a struggle, but again, you have to think back and have that headspace to say, what is real? 
And what is my head just playing games with me? The parallel would be like a free throw shot. If anyone has played basketball and you're at the free throw line, you've done it a thousand times, balance eyes on target, elbow in, and yet you still go for that free throw shot, whether you're alone or whether you're in the middle of a game and you miss, why do you miss, right? Someone might say it's just a free throw shot. But at that moment, you feel like you've failed yourself, whether it's just a practice or not. And so, I mean, I'm not saying like a startup is like a free throw shop, but there's parallels as a metaphor. I don't want to fail. But you know what? If I do, this isn't the first time that I have failed and I just need to get up, have some breakfast, right? Maybe do some yoga and then just do the same thing. And then um, there's a book called The One Thing. And actually, a, um, a colleague of mine from Techstars, um, I'm in that program right now. The managing director recommended it and best book ever. And why? What is the one thing that you need to get done? In this world, we always have like a thousand things and we have a to-do list. And I don't know about you. I have my to-do list. I barely get through 80% of it. And so now I always frame it as, okay, let me get out of my head. How do I do that? For me, it's running, being with my son, being with family. And then I think about what's the one thing I want to get done today, right? Uh, Sion Shamsu wanted to know, um, if you had any advice on how to network with people and stay in contact with, uh, certain people that were important in the development of your career or education. Yeah. Um, great analogy. Um, I was in actually, uh, MIT alum group at Apple and one of the, um, uh, heads of a program basically said, you know, pay forward, right? So like, reach out to, I think he said, I can't remember if it was four or five people, so I'm, a, I'm butchering it a bit, but it, it, it stuck with me, right? Also even back to Gaucho's tenant of give back, right? Pay it forward, you meet five people, just reach out to them, ask them, hey, what do you need, right? How can I help? Or how can I learn from you? And just keep, I mean, do it, you know, principled, transparent, right? Intentional about, um, heartfelt, right? You know understand why you want to connect, how you want to connect. You'd be surprised also. I mean, that was kind of deep how I, I painted that picture. If you feel comfortable, do that. Um, uh, a lot of people, you know, you can cold do cold outreach, warm introductions are best, even on LinkedIn. Because imagine if you reach out to someone and you're like, I need your help. Who's going to turn away? They might say, I would, you know, what specifically do you need help with? Right. So be specific about it. But who's not going to want to respond to someone saying, there's something about your history and your, your um, background that I'd like to learn more. A lot of people want to talk about like their background and themselves, whether altruistically or otherwise. The hope is altruistically. So know who you're asking, why you're asking, um, and be confident about it. I think nine times out of 10, folks just don't feel confident to go say, yes, I need help, right? Um, so that's, that's what I would suggest. Yeah. And, uh, our last question, I believe for today, uh, from Sai Kilimpali, uh, asks after college, would you recommend joining a corporate or a startup? Also, do you think, uh, one should have experience in another company before starting a startup company? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I, I don't know enough about you and your journey. Um, and, you know, I'm a firm believer of, you know, anyone that's telling you what to do, how to do it versus um, just sharing something about their background that could be helpful to your decision process. You know, I, I think you go with your gut. You know what you would want to do. I think if you're asking me the question in a different way, which is, you know, it's a very hard question to answer for me to say you should do startup or you should have this this experience. I mean, I, I think it's different for every person. And I apologize. I know that's not the answer that you probably wanted me to share. Um, but I'm happy to have a conversation with you. Reach out to me. I think Bob has my email. I'm happy to dive into that a bit more uh, and understand, you know, more of the questions behind behind the question you're asking. Yeah. So feel free. My door's, my door's open. Um, reach out and happy to chat more about it. Thanks for having me. Oh, hang on a second here. We have a couple of uh, students 
um, from the serious games with artificial intelligence. Okay. That would like have a small presentation for you. Go ahead, Ada and Isaiah. Yeah, so um, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Fernandez Cole, for giving us this talk. I think um, your motto that you um, told us at the beginning, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? Um, like that specifically really struck me. Like um, I've used kind of similar words personally um, to help me come out of my shell. Like I'm kind of naturally a shy person. Um, and kind of it like give me the confidence to just go out and do something. Like even if you're scared, like just take a risk. And um, also what you said, um, about the theme of giving back. And I really like how you took that to like all your companies, especially like Da Vinci wearables. Um, just the way you kind of kept that within you. It was just really inspiring to hear about. Thank you. Yeah, I really liked your lecture. I really found it inspiring how, you know, despite the setback with your basketball career, you were able to find a passion through something else and then kind of apply your own experiences and find like a business that you could make to help empower other women. So as a courtesy, we would like to give you this Beaverworks shirt. I don't know if you could see Thank it because I have the yes, blur on, but. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. In here? Yeah, just like. Right here? Oh, perfect. Thank you so much for having I'm going to take a selfie. Oh, actually. <laughs> <laughs>